Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our May 1st Tuesday event. I want to first say thank you to our audience for joining us. And it's been a real pleasure having our entire global community join us this year to hear from our speakers at First Tuesday. I'd also like to thank Wells Fargo, who's our longstanding corporate sponsor for this event, and to Twin Cities Business for um, you know, being the media sponsor and for the continued media support for the speaker series. Today, we're joined by our featured speaker, Hubert Jolie, former chairman and chief uh, executive officer of Best Buy. And for our format today, I'll be asking Hubert a few questions of my own before taking questions from our audience. But before we start, let me tell you a little bit about Hubert. Hubert is senior lecturer at Harvard Business School. And as mentioned, the former chairman and CEO of Best Buy, he also served as president and CEO of CWT, which is formerly known as Carlson Wagonly Travel. Currently, he serves on the board of directors of Johnson & Johnson and the Ralph Lauren Corporation. And he's also a member of the International Advisory Board of HAC Paris, and is a trustee of the Minneapolis Institute of Art. Uh, Hubert Jolie has been recognized, as you may know, as one of the top 100 CEOs in the world by Harvard Business Review, one of the top 30 CEOs in the world by Barron's, and one of the top 10 CEOs in the US by Glassdoor. And that last one is actually particularly good because that, you know, that means that the employees really liked him. He's also the author of The Heart of Business, Leadership Principles for the Next Era of Capitalism. And I'm proud to say that it was just released today. And Hubert will be telling us more about that book. For many years now, Hubert has also been a wonderful friend and a partner to the Carlson School. He served on our board of overseers. He's now a member of our emeritus board. And we sincerely thank him for everything he has done to support our community here in the Twin Cities and at the University of Minnesota. Hubert, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, sweet, it's so good to see you. And, and I so look forward to our conversation and seeing so many of our great friends here. So thank you. Well, thank you, Hubert. I think we'll plunge straight into the questions. One of the things that has intrigued me is that, you know, when you took over Best Buy, Things were pretty bleak out there. A previous CEO had left suddenly. The you know people were showrooming at the store and buying from you know competitors online. You know why did you accept this position and what was it like in those early years? Yeah, the um, I didn't need to leave. You know the wonderful Carlson companies, um, and and yet so it, I think it was the May of, of 2012, uh, Sri, that I got this phone call from my good friend, uh, uh, Jim Citrin at Spencer Stewart. And I had known Jim for a long time and he calls me about the Best Buy job. And, you know, as you said, it was a, a bit of a mess. And plus I knew nothing about retail. Right. And so I told him, Jim, you're crazy, right? <laughs> Why would you want me to take the job? He said, well, they're not looking for a retailer. Mm -hmm. They're looking with uh, for um, somebody who can bring a fresh perspective. I think you're a great turnaround guy. You've done this before, you'd be great. So do me a favor study <laughs> so uh, this is so of course i followed his advice and here's what i saw sri uh, the world needed best buy you know customers needed best buy because you know for some of our technology purchases it's actually helpful to be able to touch feel and see the products and and ask questions and then the vendors needed best buy because if they spend you know billions of dollars on r d investment to create these great products if they're just in a box at walmart or just on the site, you cannot see the picture quality, you cannot hear the sound. And so it's actually uh, helpful for them. And so I felt, you know, strategically, there was nothing wrong with Best Buy, but that all of their problems were essentially self-inflicted, yeah. uh, which was great news, right? The quality of service had gone down, they were not great online. So they had nothing to, nobody else to blame, but, but uh, you know, but Best Buy, which was good news, because when if, if it's self-inflicted, you can actually fix it. And so that really shaped the first phase of our, of our approach at, uh, at Best Buy, the, the turnaround phase, which we called uh, Renew Blue. Renew Blue. And what were those early years like? I mean, with, you know, you were within a few years, you actually got the Best Buy on a path to, you know, turn the company around. But what were those early years like? It was, uh, I think all of us who were involved, I think in general, have very fond memories because this was a roll up your sleeve moment where we were all trying to save this amazing iconic 
Minnesota company that had a great legacy, you know, more than 100,000 people work at Best Buy. Yeah. And so you wanted, that's what you wanted to do. So we worked hard. It was about figuring out what to do. So one of my best memories was my first job, my first week on the job. Mm -hmm. uh, I spent it in St. Cloud, Minnesota. Uh, I went to the store there, working with the employees, listening to the employees in the store GM, because if it's a if 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 it's a matter of fixing the operations, you actually want to ask people on the front line what's working, what's not working. So one of the things, for example, I heard from one of the employees was uh, we had the search engine on the site is not on the Best Buy site is not working. I said, what do you mean it's not working? I said, well, type Cinderella the movie you'll get Nikon cameras. It rhymes, but it's not quite the same. And nobody in headquarters, I think, would have mentioned that to me. <laughs> you know, it's a bit embarrassing. So they also showed me how they wanted to be able to match Amazon prices, right? Because you had people showrooming, you talked about it, coming to the store, talking to our associate, and then leaving empty-handed. So I learned so much from them. The store GM also told me, Amer, you know, you guys are giving us 41 key performance indicators to focus on. I can't, I mean, I, I want to do a good job, but I can't focus on 41 things. Yeah. So it'd be so helpful if you could simplify and tell us the, the top things you'd like us to focus on, then we'll do it, you know? Mm -hmm. So uh, listening to the frontliners, and I think that, you know, in turnarounds, too often, mm -hmm. it's cut, 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 right? In fact, some people were telling me, close stores, Cut headcounts, like if uh, people are the problem, right. and all of our stores were profitable. So this was nonsense. And so my philosophy of a turnaround is actually listen. You know, it's people centric. Listen to the frontliners. Make sure you have the right team at the top. From an operational lever standpoint, focus first on growing the top line. Right. Estimating what growth can do. Uh, if you're going to cut costs, and at this point we took two billion dollars of cost out since uh, 2012. Mm -hmm. uh, focus first on non-salary expenses. So everything in the cost structure that has nothing to do with people and cut headcount as a last resort. So as an example, mm -hmm. you know, at Best Buy, do we sell a lot of TVs? Yes, we do. You know, they're large, they're thin, so they break. And so we would break about $200 million worth of TVs every year. Wow. Uh, and if you can reduce that by 50% by, you know, reviewing the supply chain, you know, the customers are happy because we've checked three, zero percent of customers want to buy a broken TV, you know, right. <laughs> and it's yeah. good for the PL. So, and then from a leadership standpoint, it's all about creating energy, mm -hmm. right? Because right. what we did, you know, uh, how smart was it? You know, there was one smart thing we did, which was to partner with the, the tech companies to do these uh, store within the store, mm -hmm. but most of it was commonsensical, and so the key was. How do you create energy within the organization so that you know you can move things forward? Right. And so this was a very exciting time because we were on a mission to save the company. We made, were making progress quarter after quarter, and and then we could decide that the turnaround was done. Right. No, I mean you clearly had a you know were very successful with it. I mean a tenfold increase in stock price during your tenure at CEO. That's not easy to accomplish in an industry that was being hammered by competition. I mean, so many competitors were going out of business at that time. So it was just uh, amazing what you were able to accomplish. And I love this idea that you focus on the non-salary costs and the, you know, try and take those out because there is a lot of, you know, just things that legacy things that kind of pile up that, you know, that you, uh, that, that you can't uh, um, yes. sort of uh, work on. Um, you know, I just, uh, you know, also, I'm just very excited about this book that is coming out of yours is The Heart of Business. And you talk there about leading with purpose and humanity. Yes. And what do you mean by that? What is leading with purpose? What's leading with humanity? Can you tell us a little bit more about this philosophy, please? Yeah, the, the, the book is the philosophy behind the resurgence of Best Buy. So it's really not, you know, the book is not a play-by-play -play of what we did, although it's there, mm -hmm. but there's a bigger philosophy that I want to uh, describe. And, and I think that's very timely because in so many ways, the world we live in, we can probably all agree with this. You know, we're in crisis, right? There's a health crisis, there's an economic crisis, there's a 
societal crisis, racial crisis, environmental crisis, geopolitical issues. So uh, there you have it. And and Sri, what's the definition of madness, right? Doing the same thing and hoping for a different outcome. That's uh, according to our friend Albert Einstein. And what have we been doing if we step back in the last 40 years? I think there's two people on my uh, FBI most wanted list. One is Milton Friedman, mm -hmm. inventor of shareholder primacy. I think the an excessive focus on profit is dangerous. And two is Bob McNamara, the former U.S. Secretary of State, uh, Secretary of Defense, who invented at Ford scientific top-down management. And that doesn't work either. So I think this is a time where we need to reinvent business and capitalism. It, and it's around purpose and humanity. And I think this movement is underway. And what I wanted to do is add my voice to this because it's hard to, it's, it's easy to say, but it's hard to do. So what is the big idea here is that uh, indeed, instead of seeing uh, having a, a, a strong focus on profit, you treat profit as an outcome, okay. not the goal. I think the goal of a corporate, if you think about a corporation, okay, so we're going to do some philosophies, right? All right. Okay. <laughs> uh, what is a corporation? I think it's a, it's a human organization made of individuals working together in pursuit of a goal. Yeah. And if we think about this goal at a personal level, when we ask ourselves, you know, what, why do we work? What's the meaning of our life? I bet with your students, it's really going to be I think the key meaning of my life is I've made VP by the age of 30. Or, you know, in my class from the Carlson School, I was the highest paid, you know, alumnus. That's not truly what drives people uh, at the core. I think in, in ourselves, in it's true in all, I think it's true around the world in all spiritualities, right? There's a desire to do something good in the world. Right. You know, you can call it contributing to the common good, you know, and it's the idea of pursuing a noble purpose, which is not philanthropy. Philanthropy is a different thing. For me, at the core of business is the idea of pursuing a noble purpose, which you find at the intersection between what the world needs, what you're good at uniquely, what you're passionate about, and how you can make money. And for us at Best Buy, this was transform transformational because at some point we said, here's the scoop. We're not a consumer electronics retailer. Okay, so maybe we should put a... Uh, write an article and it should call the Star Tribune and Best Buy is not a retailer, right? Uh, we're a company that's there to enrich lives, we said, through technology mm. by addressing key human needs, which is much more inspiring and also expands the addressable markets. And so that's the, for me, that's the North Star. And the second point you mentioned is put people at the center, right. as the source, as the engine of companies not as a resource, not as capital, but as the, as the soul of the, of the organization. And our role as, as a leader is to really unleash human magic in pursuit of that purpose and tapping in the unique genius of, uh, of every employee. That's the, that's the broad philosophy. Really easy to say, right? It took me two minutes right. to say it. Yeah. Really hard to do. I mean, that's exactly what I wonder about because, you know, at the Carlson School, I mean, everything you say resonates so much. Yeah. You know, we, you know, talk about business as a force for good. Yes. And it's really that was the name of your campaign, that. right? The name right. of the capital campaign. I love that. That's right. Business is a force for good. So it's like, how do we actually, you know, make a business a force for good? And so how do you actually make that happen? You yes. guys? How did you, how did you come up with this? How did you, more than that, how did you bring... 100,000 yes. employees with you in this process. I mean, tell us a little more about the how. Do you see the scars on my face, Sri? Because <laughs> it's, it's a journey. So let me tell you some of the challenges sure. along the way and how we uh, sort of dealt with them. Mm -hmm. So the first thing, because this, this was a big transformation. The first thing is uh, I, was make, I made a mistake. Mm -hmm. Okay, I assumed that... Uh, the people running the organization could at the same time transform the organization into that purposeful, you know, a, a company in pursuit of that purpose. Mm -hmm. Say so it's clear, this is where we're going. So just do it, right? The Nike approach. Here's the problem, running a company like Best Buy, that's a big deal. It's close to $50 billion in revenue, more than 100,000 people. I mean, it, it's a complex machine. So my expectation was unrealistic. There was not the capacity to do this. 
-hmm. So the way we solve that was by creating, and many companies do this, on the side, what we called the strategic gross office, which was there to um, refine the strategy, design um, uh, new initiatives, new strategic initiatives, pilot them, test them, and see how to scale them. Uh, this, this organization was initially led by Corey Barry, who yeah. everybody knows and love. And, and by the way, when, we, when you said that we increased the share price by 10x, that includes you know, Corey's contribution one of the sources of pride is when you know your successor continues to mm -hmm. to improve as opposed to you know some you know a big collapse and Corey is doing a fabulous job and so having that organization was very helpful mm -hmm. but then there was another challenge mm -hmm. you, you know how do we help everybody at the company write themselves into that story right? because it's easy to write your purpose right, right. Uh, imagine three you and i walk into a best buy store mm -hmm. talk to the blue shirts and we say we have great news we have a new purpose. We're going to enrich lives through technology by addressing key human needs. You know, the blue shirts are going to say, you're saying, what? What, what do you want me to do when I take my shift at, uh, at 10 a.m.? It uh, doesn't make much sense, right? So how do you bring it down? Not down, but how do you make it tangible and understandable? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and so here's one thing we did. We, one Saturday... And we closed all of the stores for a few hours to really take a moment to think about what are we trying to accomplish going forward? No PowerPoint slides, no glossy video, uh, but we get into small groups. Okay. And I remember this, we work on two questions. Uh, one, share with each other the story of your life, your life story. So I got paired with a young woman mm. She had been in an abusive relationship with an ex-boyfriend. She had been homeless. And Best Buy was really her home. So all of a sudden, I really don't see her as an employee, right? But as a human being. Yes. Okay? So stay with me. Second thing, uh, share with each other somebody in your life who is an inspiring friend. Right? Hopefully everybody's got an inspiring friend in their life. If you don't, Call Sri or I after class will be, will try to be a, your inspiring friend. Mm -hmm. For me, it's my older brother. Philip is a wonderful guy. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what we're trying to do is simple. Mm -hmm. We're going to try to treat each other and our customers as human beings. Okay. And we're going to try to be inspiring friends for each other and for our customers. So make it very human. It sounds soft uh but that triggered and then of course you have to complement it because you of course you want to create an environment where it's actually possible it's not it's not about numbers 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 it's right. about being very human in the book i talk about I describe the ingredients mm -hmm. for creating an environment where you can truly create human magic and it's a very different mindset that you know bob mcnamara would have us do it you know, he would be focused, let's create the strategy, let's create the KPIs, put incentives in place, track compliance. Mm -hmm. That doesn't work. Motivation is intrinsic. Nobody likes to be told what to do. Right. So how do you create that fertile ground? Mm -hmm. uh, and that's a lot of, you know, the stories and the, you know, the practical examples of how you do this. At the end of each chapter, there's questions, there are self-reflective questions on how you can apply this. Uh, and, oh, by the way, a cool thing on the, uh, and maybe we'll put it in the chat, but uh, I have a website now, my first name, my last name.org, I'll put it in the chat. And there is a business electrocardiogram. Wow. <laughs> it's an assessment tool where you can assess the health of your health, of the heart of your business. <laughs> and helps you point to the areas where you can start, you know, where you can focus. That's, you know, that's such practical advice, you better, because I mean, even the, this humanizing in the roles of everyone in the organization. I mean, that is so, so special because when you know their backstories, they're no longer just a, a number and a head count. And, you know, and it's, it's such, a, uh, such a powerful, powerful exercise. I mean, I, I am, uh, you know, I think I'm just uh, blown away by that. It's just great. It's fantastic. Thank you. Thank and, uh, you know, I mean, in this context, I mean, I, you know, I know, you know, one of the things that all of us are struggling with right now is, 
you know, there's this idea of belonging. You know, people want to feel a sense of belonging in the in the organizations they serve, in 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 yeah. the, uh, wherever they are. And you know, I know you've done a lot also to diversify your leadership team, the board, and in fact, the entire sort of operation of Best Buy. How do you, you know, you know, why did you do that? How did yeah. you do that? Yeah. And also kind of, you know, how does that kind of, how do you sort of make sure that everybody feels a sense of belonging in that, yes. uh, in, in, that in the organization? Thank you, Sri, for this question. I think it starts, because you said everybody. So it starts with everybody. It starts with each individual. Right. And I remember uh, a conversation with a young associate mm -hmm. uh, who told me that his life changed the day a manager recognized him and took an interest in him because wow. he felt he existed mm -hmm. and my compatriot René Descartes of the Cartesian philosophy mm. you know famously said a few centuries ago I think therefore I am right. I think he's wrong mm. it's I am seen therefore I am I'm seen therefore I am. I am seen therefore I am and so it's exactly what you're talking about if I said employee I can feel that I exist that people Mm -hmm. understand who I am, take an interest in me, respect me, uh, uh, then I'm, I have a chance to be, you know, the best version of, of, of myself. And that's one of the key ingredients I, I talked about. So diversity and inclusion and belonging start with each individual. But then, of course, you have to look at systemic issues, right? You cannot be blind about them. Mm -hmm. So whether it's around gender and race and ethnicity and any uh, other kind of, uh, of dimension, and I remember, I think it was probably maybe 2016, 2017, I was seeing the employee engagement go up significantly at the company. But there was significant differences across race in particular. Okay. So I did focus groups, right? That's what you do, right? right. To listen to the, you know, to the employees. And I was struck, so you know, I grew up in France. So is there racism in France? Of course there is. Yes. There's probably racism in every country, but it's a different history. Right. And when I heard and I really felt the experience of our black colleagues, mm -hmm. I was really distressed. Mm -hmm. I was really uh, shocked. Mm -hmm. and, and I knew, because there's a lot of studies that diverse organizations, either from a gender or race, standpoint, or any kind of uh, dimension, are more productive, so I knew it in, intellectually, mm -hmm. but I really got a punch in the stomach. Right. And so that we had always had a diversity and inclusion program. Let's let's admit that in America, every company has had a diversity and inclusion program, <laughs> probably every university, and progress had been very, very, very slow, in particular around this issue of race. And so that gave us the the the, the, the sense of urgency to move forward. I got a wonderful reverse mentor, really a mentor, Laura Gladney, a young black African-American woman. I learned so much from her. And we studied a program to really review how we recruit, uh, how we promote, how we retain, how we diversify our supplier base, mm -hmm. and importantly, how we change the top. So Melody Hobson, the wonderful co-CEO of Aerial Investment and chair of Starbucks, sure. told me you cannot be who you cannot see. And so I say, okay, so that work on your board. Mm -hmm. And in a sense, the board may be the easiest place where to diversify because it's only 10 people. Right. So how hard, so when I left the board, we had a majority of women and three African-American directors. Mm -hmm. How hard can it be to find just a handful of people? Right. And, and, but you have to want to do it. So we told the, and I'll end with this maybe, mm -hmm. um, I told the headhunter that was helping us with mm -hmm. Kathy Higgins, Victor, the, the chair of our NAMGOF committee, mm -hmm. uh, don't bother showing us resumes of non-Black candidates. Mm -hmm. right? And if you feel that you're not going to be able to give us uh, resumes of great Black candidates, we say, that's okay, we'll accept this. We'll completely accept it, except we'll work with a different firm, you know? <laughs> <laughs> And of course, they found some, you know, three fabulous directors who've uh, really helped us. So I think there's a, there's today, following the horrible murder of George Floyd, there's a sense of urgency, there's an accountability now. Companies are setting goals, boards are holding management teams accountable, mm -hmm. and we're now doing the work. And in America, 
in the corporate world, I think you would agree with me. Once we've decided that something was important, we know how to get things done. So I think the world has decided that solving systemic racism was important. Mm -hmm. And so I think we have to stay with it and, and hold ourselves accountable. You're, uh, you know, you're absolutely right on so many, so many counts. And I, you know, I just love that, uh, you know, just also about this, uh, you know, I, I, um, uh, I am because I'm recognized. I mean, I'm seen and therefore I am. I'm not just, not just, I think therefore I am. So, yeah. and that is so important, even at a university, yeah. you know, I mean, that's exactly what we try, you know, and to communicate, which is that for each of our students, it's that being recognized, it's, you know, being, uh, you know, knowing their backstory, you know, how do we take it down to that individual level? I mean, that is so important. So important. You, you yes. make me think, Sri, of a, a store general manager mm. in Boston. Mm. He would ask every one of the associates in his store, so about 100 of them, mm. tell me about your dream at Best Buy or outside of Best Buy. What is your dream? Mm. Okay. Write it down in the break room. Wow. My goal mm. as the store GM is to help you achieve your dream. Right. Wow. wow. That, and that's, that's transformational. Right. It is. It truly is. Yeah. You know, you, you, you've talked a lot about, you know, how you bring your team together and how do you keep them engaged? How do you give them that sense of belonging? You know, how do we, you know, make sure that, the, you know, that, the, they, that they reach their full potential? But as, as a leader, you know, uh, do you feel that the role of the CEO has changed over these past 10 years? I mean, over the time that you've been CEO, yeah. have you seen the kind of leadership that's expected or needed yes. change over this time? Yeah, th th thank you for stressing this, Sri. This is uh, such a fundamental shift, right? The, the role of CEOs, the role of leaders has changed fundamentally. How? The mission has changed. Right, we've talked about it. it used to be about shareholder value creation. Now it's about being a force for good in the world. Yeah. The scope has changed. To quote Godfather, yeah. you know, <laughs> tell Michael, I actually liked him. It was only business, nothing personal. It was all about business. Right. No, now it's about, you know, yes, business, but also community. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we've seen it in Minneapolis. Right. When the city is, when the community is on fire, cannot open the stores, cannot run a business. If the planet is on fire, cannot run a business. According to Larry Fink, CEO of BlackRock, that's the big environmental changes is the biggest risk that uh, business has. So we need a declaration of mm -hmm. interdependence, right? As business, we cannot succeed on our own. And then the leadership model has changed in all of this. Right. Remember the old model of uh, the leader as the superhero, Girl. he's got all of the answers, was driven by power, fame, glory, and money. We probably have some in our network that uh, used to be leaders. Mm -hmm. No, that's not what people want. Employees and customers want different kinds of leaders, right? It's, a, it's somebody who is purpose-driven, is clear about who they are, what kind of impact they want to have. They're much more caring. They're vulnerable. Mm -hmm. It's not about them. I told the officers at Best Buy, you know, when we were clarifying our expectations, I told them, that, look, if you're if you think you're you're serving yourself or your boss mm -hmm. or me as the CEO of the company, it's okay. I don't have a problem with that, mm -hmm. except you cannot work here, right? We're going to promote you to customer and we're going to take good care of you. Right. Uh, on the other hand, if you're here to serve others, mm -hmm. serve the frontliners, that, then we're good, right? It's the idea of the leader mm -hmm. being here to create the right environment for others to be successful. That's it. It's a sea change because so many of us, self-included, were trained to use, you know, to lead from, you know, with our brain. Mm -hmm. I think today we need to lead with all of our body parts, meaning the brain, but also the heart, the soul, the guts, the ears, the eyes. Mm -hmm. That's very different. That's amazing. Yes, that's absolutely, you know, you're absolutely right. I think the whole, uh, and, 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 you know, the world needs it. The world needs people who lead with their hearts. I mean, it's just... Uh, that's uh, so important. Yes. Uh, you know, it's, um, I know you are now a business school educator. So congratulations. Welcome to the fold. <laughs> uh, I am at the bottom of the ladder. I am a young <laughs> Padawan. I am trying to learn my new trades, uh, uh, Sri. And anytime I, I may call you from time to time to ask you for help. You know? Oh, and <laughs> we'll call on you as well. But this is, uh, you know, I just, uh, what, what, 
suggestions do you have for business schools? I mean, like schools like ours, as we're trying to no. educate and develop and uh, transform the lives of you know our our students, and as you know, no. as build them up to be the kind of leaders we want them to be for the future. What should we be doing? Is it should we be doing something differently? Yeah, I think in, in most business schools on a journey, I mean, there, there's uh, an, all, an entire conversation around um, scaling and you know, learning, uh, uh, distance learning. And during, of course, pandemic, we've all experienced that. But beyond that, there's something fundamental. And I know you're on it, and many, many business schools are on it. Historically, I think we're placing a lot of emphasis on learning techniques. So in the no, do, be, Right. It was a lot of emphasis on do, on excuse me, on no, a little bit on do. I don't know what your perspective is. I think I know actually, but uh, are the greatest leaders the greatest leaders because they're the best at spelling out the four P's of marketing or the best at calculating a net present value? Of course not. Right. All right? It's about the B. And uh, my conviction is that we're not born leaders, we become leaders. Mm -hmm. And I think business, I think it's indispensable. Hmm. that business education, education in general, helps us uh, at every stage in our journey, right, to be clear about what kind of a leader we want to be. Right. You know, what's our true purpose? If our good friend Bill George was here, what's our true north, right? Hmm. Hmm. And discovering your authentic leader hmm. and then learning how to lead from a place of purpose and with humanity. Hmm which I think is you know, essential. And we've seen so many great examples of that during the uh, crisis. And I'm passionate about that. That's why I, became, I joined the faculty at HBS. That's why at HEC in Paris, I endowed a chair on uh, purposeful leadership. And, uh, and I'm gonna be working on designing a, a, a curriculum on, uh, you know, inspired by the principles in the book. And there's many great examples of that across business schools, but I think that you know, back to this idea, you know, doing the same thing and hoping for a different outcome, not smart. And so how do we prepare the next generation mm -hmm. to create, to help them create a, a future that does not exist yet, but that needs to be more sustainable. Right. I think that's the, that's the imperative. And I think everybody's on it, right? It's not, I'm not telling you anything you don't know. Yeah. Well, I mean, I really like this no do be uh, uh, categorization of yours. Mm -hmm. And at some level, the knowledge part, the no part, you know, every Google's at our fingertips, you know, it's, you, you know, that's <laughs> taken a back seat. Yeah. Uh, and for us and at the Carlson School, we're very focused on the doing and being because, yeah. you know, you learn who you are and how yeah. to be through yeah. doing, you know, yeah. and then applying the knowledge that you may have, you know, picked up. So that's our, a big focus for us is very much that experiential kind of component, which hopefully will translate into people understanding themselves better you know you almost have to flip them. you almost have to flip it right the no do be right maybe it needs to become be do no be do no yeah you almost have to flip it maybe in terms of priorities yes yeah. absolutely in sequencing yeah. maybe I, I don't know I, I have so much to learn i'm a young padawan i don't know i know that i don't know you know right right, right. No, this is uh, this is terrific. I, you know, I think at this point, uh, you know, I, I know there should be questions from the audience. And audience, you can put your questions in the Q and A chat or in the chat. Amy, how are we doing on questions? There are quite a few coming in, so I'm happy to get started. Okay, wonderful. So Hubert, thank you for uh, for uh, your comments thus far, and I'm sure we'll hear more from the audience about what they want to know from you. No, or and and they may you may we may call on you, or they may call on you for answers as well. So we're doing this together. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, we will get started with our first question. Um, Hubert, what counsel can you give management consultants to be more effective for their clients? Ooh, I used to be one. <laughs> I I think that I mean I, I'll share with you how I've used consultants, and I've used consultants you know, in my various jobs, I, I never use them to provide the answer, right? Uh, I used, we use them to, as partners, supplementing our efforts, sometimes bringing some expertise, but I always felt it was about enabling the organization to move forward, building new capabilities, 
So, you know, there's new things coming up all the time. So moving to agile and sprints and so forth. So build, so it's the idea of, don't tell us what time it is, right? Uh, help us not only uh, read the time, but maybe create the watch, right? <laughs> it's in, and of course, you, you're seeing the best firms, uh, obviously, in, in that direction. So, uh, and it's back to this point about a lot of consulting in my time, <laughs> a long time ago, was about problem solving, coming up with the answer. I think it's much more about help us create the right environment, right? This is the, to me, this is the new frontier that uh, we're working on. That, so, I don't know, you've asked me, this would be two, two suggestions. Thank you. Um, we had a question about Wall Street. How do you placate Wall Street, who tends to focus more on profit making than compassion? How do you help investors realize that short term losses may be required for longer term sustainable growth or gains through investment in people? Yeah, so, you know, sometimes companies blame Wall Street, the short termism of Wall Street for their inability to get things done. I think that's not appropriate. When you really speak, you now of course there's different, Wall Street does not exist. There's a bunch of different types of investors. Of course you have the short termist and you have the activist, but many uh, investors are there to take care of our retirement. They're long-term investors or they're index investors. And you know, if you read, uh, so every year Larry Fink, CEO of BlackRock and same with State Street and Vanguard, they write to the CEOs of, uh, of, of public companies and, you know, Larry started to talk about purpose, I think it was four years ago, importance of long-term strategy. His letter this year is all about the environment and, you know, the, the focus on ESG is very strong. So I think investors get it. They understand that, uh, you know, for a company to be successful, it needs to uh, do the kinds of things I'm talking about. I think I've, I've not really invented it. I think that what I'm passionate about is what does it take to make this happen? And so, uh, Sometimes now people oppose stakeholder capitalism and shareholder capitalism. Like if a focus on purpose and stakeholders was an excuse to make less profit. Uh, 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 I don't think that's the right idea. My view is that it's by pursuing a noble purpose and really unleashing human magic and embracing all stakeholders. That, that is a great way, it may not be the only way, but it's a great way to create massive value for all stakeholders, including the shareholders. The key is, I think, is to be transparent with the shareholders, explain to them what you're doing. I think they don't, one of the things they don't like, and I don't blame them, right, is if you tell them, look, I'm gonna reduce my profits by 50% for the next five years, and in five years from now, it's all gonna be good. Eh, you know, it's not very palatable. So one of the things we did at Best Buy to overcome that was uh, we would self-fund our investments. So we would find savings, non-salary expense savings for the most part, so that we can could fund our investments and fund some margin expansion. So, because if you can, so here's a, something I learned a long time ago. Ninety-eight percent of the questions that I ask as either or are better answered as ands. Should we focus on the short term or the long term? Well, both. Should we focus on the customers or the shareholders? Both. And I think our job as leaders is to embrace that apparent complexity and find ways to come up with win-win uh, uh, outcomes. So I refuse uh, <laughs> choosing here. Thank you. Um, what counsel are you giving to improve board of directors governance? Well, you know, I would say that board governance has improved materially in the last 10 or 20 years. Uh, I think boards are, you know, the, the, it used to be that it was before my time, but the old boys network where you know people would call their friends and the main requirement on the board was to not disturb the, the, the very powerful CEO. Uh, that's all, these days are over. Uh, I've always seen as a CEO, I've always seen the board as a as a wonderful you know support mechanism that could give me superhuman powers, right? Because I, I could tap their intelligence, their experience. The boards are very focused today on succession planning, so talent development, uh, strategy, making sure you have a strategy that's uh, working, compliance, making sure uh, that nobody goes to uh, to jail. But there's new dimension, and that may be where where you know the perk is going. If you believe in my theory of purpose, 
and unleashing human magic. That means boards need to go deeper into, you could say, cultural issues. What is it like to be working at the company? Not seeing the company as a black box, but looking at the, at the culture. Cannot do this easily from the boardroom. So one of the things we did at Best Buy, many companies do this, right? Take the board out. Uh, so you know, we took our board to different markets, San Francisco, New York. Uh, we organized three panels with frontliners. We didn't prep the frontliners to tell them only tell good things to the board, just you know, say what you have to say so that the board could know exactly where we were and truly get a sense of what was truly happening at the, at the company. Uh, if you're not a confident CEO, that can be very uncomfortable, right? But that's not the kind of CEO you, you, you want. So I think add the, this focus on culture and go deeper into the culture to understand what it's really like to be at the company, while at the same time keeping the, dif the, the, the difference between governance and management. As Kurt Carlson would say, nose in, fingers out. So I think you got it right, right? Nose in, you can go as deep as you want, but you're not in charge, right? So that's the distinction. of Kurt, I see a, a, a question from your former, former boss, Marilyn Nelson. Oh, no, Marilyn. <laughs> <laughs> but she's asking something extremely relevant to the times, I think. She said, Hubert, when and how should CEOs weigh in publicly on issues? You know, this is an issue that everyone is, uh, you know, confronting right now. I mean, what the world needs, yeah. should they consult yeah. the board, anyone else? So, Marilyn, it's so great to hear from you. I, I, before I answer this question, I want to disclose to everybody a great question that, Marilyn, you asked me uh, when we were talking about my potentially being your successor at CALSA. And I hope you won't mind if I share it because I think it was such a powerful question. You asked me, Uber, tell me about your soul. And you're the only person in the world I ever heard ask this question, but such a powerful question, right? Because the most important decision we make as leaders is who do we put in position of responsibility? And it cannot just be about expertise and experience, right? But it's who is this individual? And I've never asked the question exactly like this, but I've asked the question, you know, what drives you? What kind of a leader do you want to be? How do you want to be remembered? I think you'll, you know, you agree that it's a, it's, a, it's close. But I want to thank you for everything I've learned from you, Marilyn. You've been a uh, great friend and source of inspiration. I'm almost, I'm actually emotional. So on the question you're asking, which is when should CEOs get involved in societal issues? So here, of course, you have to start with saying, we're not elected officials, right? We're not, we don't have that legitimacy. And so we cannot get confused. We're, we're not running the country or the state. Having said that, you know, as with as has been evident following the murder of George Floyd, as I said, if the city is on fire, you cannot run your business. So, in this declaration of interdependence, which is a, I should give credit to Marilyn. That's the the first time I heard that phrase was Marilyn when you said it. Um, you know, we, of course, we we have to feel responsible for the community, and in Minnesota, we deeply understand this. My thought is this, is that we need a process and a set of criteria to decide when we get involved. And so the process is, I don't think it's just up to the CEO. So at Best Buy, I would have the different functions weigh in on the criteria so that, because if I was gonna represent the company, it had to be a thoughtful uh, approach, at least that's my <laughs> approach. And the criteria for me, and you know, everybody's gonna have their list, but uh, number one, uh, is, is it a, an issue that's relevant to the company? So if you're Walmart, you know, you're selling guns. So weighing on guns, you know, is very legitimate. If you're Microsoft, H1B visa is a very important issue for you. So you weigh, weigh in is, is legitimate. At Best Buy, we weighed in on uh, uh, Dreamers and DACA because so many of our employees were, were Dreamers. So is the issue relevant to you? And of course, systemic racism that's definitely relevant uh, to you because, you know, how can you run a business if you, 
don't represent the community and the customers that you're that you're serving and if you're not able to attract the best from every group so that's the first criteria the second criteria is legitimacy do you have something to say that's interest that's relevant and and pertinent so for example if you're weighing in on this piece of legislation have you actually read the, the piece of legislation then you have uh, authenticity and and congruence if you're going to say something publicly is it just for show or is it actually something that you're doing internally so as an example remember a few years ago nike did a commercial on uh, colin kaepernick and uh, colin kaepernick taking the knee and that was legitimate because they have a, a lot of black you know, athletes and so forth, but they got criticized because their internal DNI practices were not, you know, what they could have been. And so they were lagging a little bit behind. So, you know, one of the things my mother told me is before you tell other people what to do, you know, look, look at yourself and see what you're doing. I'm not saying they should not have done this, but then it, if you're raising the bar in what you're saying, then you of course have to look at, uh, at things. Then you have to look at efficacy, right? Is what you're gonna do something that's gonna be impactful? Just saying something just for show is not good enough. So in other words, this is, you know, I don't know the whether my list is actually, I, I'm looking at a piece of paper because I do have a list, um, but you, you, you have to, to go through, a, agree on the type of criteria you're gonna look at. Uh, to the question of, do you consult with your board? I think that's something you feel, whether it's uh, something that you've already discussed with the board um, or whether that is something that uh, I know that when I was at Carlson, there were some matters that we discussed with the board and we debated. So that's a judgment. Um, so I think that no doubt CEOs and companies today are getting more and more involved uh, and like everything they do, they have to do it with a sense of uh, you know, logic, but also uh, heart. And, and, and being thoughtful and consistent uh, with this. So hopefully, Marilyn, that, uh, that answers your question. Thank I think you. That is, that is very, very complete, uh, Hubert. I just, uh, you know, this idea that it, you know, you weigh in on things that matter to you and that, that actually that are authentic to what you're doing yeah. and then that, yeah. that yeah. you actually implement what you are talking about. I think that's uh, all really relevant. Amy, I know there are lots of other questions, so I'll turn it over back to you. Yes. One of our uh, listeners has just purchased your book on the website provided. Um, they found it interesting that Jeff Bezos left a testimonial on your website. He was one of your biggest competitors and is still is with Best Buy's largest competitor. How did you find common ground with him when you were at Best Buy? Ah, and it's actually, uh, it raises a broader question, which is, uh, they, you have to refuse zero-sum games, right? I think that zero-sum games is another pandemic, right? The only way for you three to win is if I lose. That's crazy, right? Maybe we can both of us win. So when we developed our strategy at Best Buy, we were first and foremost focused on winning with the customer. So doing for the customers the things that we were uniquely positioned to do. So of course, we also had to look at Amazon because they are an interesting competitor. So what we did with Amazon on the one hand is we try to neutralize them. So here's my infomercial. We have the same prices as Amazon. We have a great, a great online shopping experience. And we ship as fast as they do, same day, next day, uh, without having to pay for Prime. So let, in soccer term, we would call this three a draw, right? <laughs> and then, of course, we have all of our unique assets, you know, our stores, our blue shirt, our geek sweat agents, our in-home advisors. Uh, and so forth. So that's how we thought about competing with Amazon. We first thought about uniquely winning with the customers. Now, of course, Amazon is also a product company, right? They do the Kindle, they have all of their Echo products. At some point, they even have a phone. I think they sold three of them, one to Jeff, one to Rav de la Vega, the CEO of AT&T, and one to, for me. So that was the end of their phone. <laughs> but seriously, they, they have great products. And at Best Buy, we had always decided to sell their products because you know, they're great for the customers and what we, we're in the business of selling great technology products. And then there was a unique moment. Uh, I think it was in 2018 where Amazon gave us the exclusive rights to their Fire TV platform to be embedded in smart TVs. And the only you know, way for a TV company to do a Fire TV empower, uh, powered 
uh, TV was through Best Buy, only sold at Best Buy or by Best Buy on Amazon. And when we announced that deal, and we did it in a store in Bellevue, Washington, and Jeff came to the to the store. Uh, you know, there was people from the media, Star Tribune, Wall Street Journal, and one of the things he said is that the TV is a considerate purchase. You need to see it. Best place is the world in the world to see it is Best Buy, and we've built a ten-year-long trust-based relationship with the Best Buy team, and so we felt that it was a, a good thing to uh, a good thing to do. And the same same thing is true with Apple. You know, Apple, of course, is a competitor. They have their own stores and they do a great job, amazing job in their store. But they also need Best Buy, right? Because there's many places in the world that don't have an Apple store. And even when there's an Apple store, you know, there's, uh, there's so many Apple customers. We've partnered with them uh, around uh, Apple Care and, and service. So if your phone is broken, you can go to the Apple store, but you can also go to Best Buy. And that's good for, you know, Apple. That's good for the customers. And that's good for us as well. So... I think in life, if we can find win-win-win solutions as opposed to win-lose, I think the world is uh, is better. That's my two cents. Thank you. We have a question coming in about you. Um, how do you personally go about becoming the best version of yourself, quote unquote, that you mentioned? And what helps you figure out that and attain meaningful growth as a human being? Yeah, so that's a, a very much a work in process. So you know, I'm not finished. <laughs> I think that the story, all of us on this call are leaders, right? Uh, it doesn't matter what size organization we lead. At the minimum, we're leaders of our own lives. And so um, I think key, and we've, we saw this last year, right? Before you can lead others, you have to be able to lead yourself, right? So, you know, during the lockdown, if you could, could not go outside, you know, key advice was go inside. So spend time with yourself. And again, if we give credit to our good friend, Bill George, right? Try to uh, figure out who you are and who you want to be as a leader. What is your true north? What are your value boundaries? What kind of a leader do you want to be? How do you want to be remembered? And spend time doing this. Now, uh, there's many different ways to do this. You know, it can be meditation. It can be walking around your lake in Minnesota, we have a lot of those. It can be having your personal board of director. It can be journaling. Um, it doesn't matter. It can be breathing. Don't forget to breathe, right? Breathing is so important. Um, for me, it's been notably reflection, self-reflection, meditation at the end of the day, looking at my day. And I don't do that. I wish I could do I would do it every day. I try to do it every week. Did I do my best this week? Right to do what I wanted to do, what was I thought was important. It doesn't say was I perfect. Right? It, did I do my best? And if I did not do my best, one of the things I've learned is uh, we have to learn to be kind with ourselves. Not that we have to tolerate you know our bad behaviors, but uh, you know there's always tomorrow, right? And nobody said we were going to be perfect. And uh, so that time of reflection, I put it down in a journal. That's really uh, uh, truly helpful. And I think as we go through this multifaceted crisis, not being not being afraid, you know, to ask for help. You know, my most frequently used phrase these days is "My name is Hubert, and I need help." You know? uh, is uh, is really something that's uh, that's important. I'll finish with a with an image. Remember a long time ago, Sri, when we used to fly? Yeah. Long time ago, right? Uh, on the plane, we were told if the oxygen mask comes down, right. put it on yourself first before we can help others. And it sounds selfish to say this, but I think the key thing I've learned is make sure that, yeah, take good care of yourself as a leader so that you can then be the best version of yourself. I think that's so important, Hubert. I mean, this uh, giving yourself grace, especially I see leaders all around, and it's been such a tough year for so many that uh, you know that uh, giving yourself grace. I think that's extremely yeah. important. Looking after yourself. Yeah. So thank you for yeah. that. Yeah. Do we have time for some more questions? Uh, maybe one more. 
I think we have one more. Um, we have a person, a woman who had had the honor of working with you when you were the CEO at CWT. And then she has now since left and as a Minnesota and is working in Silicon Valley. She said, I would appreciate hearing your reflections on how did the Minnesota culture and being Minnesota based contribute to the success of Best Buy's turnaround? What benefits do you believe you gained from Minnesota as the company's home base? Yeah, thank you for, that's a softball, right? <laughs> U of M is University of Minnesota, uh, right? Yeah, and, and, uh, and of course it is. And uh, I was blown away when I moved to Minnesota in 2008 to discover what my compatriot Alexis de Tocqueville had discovered in the 19th century about the US, which is the sense of uh, responsibility for the community. And I think Marilyn, you you know, shared it with me. Is in Minnesota, you 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 know, you get in the boat and you row, you row with everybody else, and that's one of the things I love about this country, and that's particularly developed in Minnesota, is that you you know, you never turn to the government to uh, hope that uh, they're going to fix things. Different from my other home country, France, where we always say. Que fait le gouvernement? What is the government doing, right? It's, it's like uh, they, they're in charge of everything. No, we start with ourselves. And so, and, and then, of course, government has a role, absolutely, but we have this sense of community and helping each other and, and you know, really good values uh, is something that's very special, which I think is why all of us were so distressed when we realized how bad this, I think the, the murder of George Floyd was a wake up call for all of us. It's not that we were not aware, but you know, it was such a big punch in the stomach, but a great wake up call, right? Because this is not us, we can do better and we need to be better. And so in Minnesota, we're not perfect, but I love, you know, and I think, is it the German and Scandinavian roots? maybe uh, Swedish roots, Marin would say, or, or Kurt Carlson, but it, these are good roots and we have so, so much to be proud of, even though we're not, we're far from being perfect. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, we are glad you, you know, chose Minnesota for, as home for so long, Hubert, and hope to keep bringing you back here too, from time to time. So uh, thank you for all of that. Um, thank you, audience, for all of your great questions. I think it's been wonderful to have you here. And uh, I, I hope you enjoyed our conversation as much as I did. And uh, next month, we have uh, Terry Rasmussen, president and CEO of Thrivent, which And she'll be speaking to us on uh, at noon on uh, Tuesday, June 1st, still virtually. And for those of you who've registered for today's post event, networking, please, you'll have to exit the Zoom call and go on to another uh, Zoom call where you can uh, uh, you can use the link in your confirmation email for the networking uh, portion of your um, uh, of this uh, conversation. And if you'd like to stick around and meet others who attended today's event, I know, Amy, you can post uh, the, the link to the networking on your chat, on the chat, and uh, the link will be in your chat. And so please, you can just copy and paste it in your browser, even if you haven't registered separately for it. So with that, I would like once again say thank you so much, Hubert. You were fantastic as always. And it's it's great to be able to call you a friend yeah. and a friend of the school, friend of Minnesota. So, and good luck in all your endeavors going forward. So thank, thank you. you. And I, I see in the chat, uh, Sreef, I take one more minute. Jennifer has put something super secret which is a link to purchase a signed copy of the book. How cool is that? So Marilyn, you don't need to, you have your own and three, right? Your own copy is coming. But uh, if you want to buy a signed copy of the book, there's a link in the chat to, uh, to do this. And remember my proceeds from the book go to the Best Buy Teen Tech Center. So, you know, you're going to do some, something good in the world uh, as well. So good for Jennifer to, it's super, a super secret link. <laughs> <laughs> so good well, thank you thank you that's wonderful to have the super secret link available to our uh, viewers today so thank yeah. you for that i know there's some great questions still on the uh q a and uh, we will send them on to you hubert thank if you, you feel up to answering them that'd thank be you. great so thank, thank you, you. For that. and thank you everyone thank you so enjoyed our conversation three it's such a treat it's a treat to have you here thank you, thank you.